All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, Stranded Marine Mammal Response in the Northern Half of Maine with Rosemary Seaton of Allied Whale College of the Atlantic. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library. We're pleased to continue to co-sponsor programs with Friends of Sears Island and glad we've been able to do so virtually. So thank you all for joining us on Zoom. <laughs> there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, we ask that you please type your questions into the chat and I will read them to Rosemary at the end. Also, please remember to keep your mics muted throughout the program. I wanna let you know the program will be recorded and later uploaded to the Belfast Free Library's YouTube page. And I believe Friends of Sears Island puts it up there too. Mm -hmm. Next, I will turn the mic over to Ashley McGuire, Outreach Coordinator for Friends of Sears Island for updates and to introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, Ashley. All right, well, thank you, Brenda. Um, thanks for co-hosting this presentation with us tonight. And thanks to Rosemary for being here. Um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Friends of Sears Island and what we have going on right now before we move into the presentation. Um, for those of you that don't already know, our organization is the land manager for the 600 acre conservation easement area on Sears Island and Searsport. And basically our mission is to maintain public accessibility and act as stewards of the land. And we also offer a wide uh, array of educational programs to the public. Um, so again, many of you have probably already been out to Sears Island and know that it's a fantastic place to hike and bike and bird watch, walk along beach, even swim there in the summer, um, and just explore a variety of habitats that are all in close proximity to one another. Uh, lots of wildlife can be spotted on the island and sometimes visitors come upon an animal that is sick or injured. And um, basically a couple of months ago, someone found a young harp seal that was up on the beach, sort of, I think, further than you would normally think you would see a beach, uh, uh, seal, excuse me. And um, they let Friends of Sears Island know about it. And we reached out to Allied Whale through a reporting hotline and we were put in touch with Rosemary, uh, who advised us on how to handle the situation. And as a result, we decided uh, this might make an interesting and relevant program topic. So. Um, right now, in addition to doing Zoom programs like this uh, one that we're doing tonight, we've been making some nature-based take and learn activity kits for families to pick up at Carver Memorial Library each month. And um, we are also about to install a spring story walk along the Homestead Trail for young children. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about all the stuff that we're doing uh, and would like to either uh, find out, what, you can either join our email list by emailing me at outreach at friends of Sears Island org and I can put you on that list you can find out about upcoming events um, or you can check out our Facebook and uh, you know website and you'll always see what's happening there too so um, we're happy to have Rosemary here tonight to speak with us about marine mammal strandings in this part of Maine uh, she's the marine mammal stranding coordinator with allied whale uh, the marine mammal lab at College of the Atlantic and she's worked with marine mammals for over 30 years. So thank you for being with us this evening, Rosemary. We'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks very much, Ashley. And um, thank you so much to the Belfast Free Library for uh, helping to host this uh, in, uh, webinar series. Um, I am the Stranding Coordinator. Uh, we look after um, one part of Maine, the northern half. And I'll talk about who looks after the southern half presently. Um, but uh, before I get going, I do want to acknowledge and honor uh, the Penobscot and Wabanaki nations who have occupied this land for thousands of years, including the Penobscot nation's land upon which the College of the Atlantic lies, that of Mount Desert Island. And a nice little uh, thing I learned was that Sears Island is known as Wasumkeg, or I thought very poetic, the Shining Beach by the indigenous Wabanaki tribes. So just a, an acknowledgement to them. So marine mammal strandings, I'm gonna talk about what is a marine mammal stranding, uh, a little bit why they happen, which is an interesting question with sort of a lot of answers, but nothing concrete. Uh, I'll talk about some of the species that we find here. I won't go into huge detail about them, uh, although it'd be easy to do, um, but that can be a whole other lectures. 
Um, I'll talk about some of the cases we've had and uh, especially working in our habitat, if you will, in the northern half of Maine, which you're all familiar, very rocky coastline uh, and so on, has its own um, interesting logistical, uh, sometimes nightmares to deal with. Um, I'll also talk about some cases from Sears Island since uh, this is sort of the focal point uh, for some of you, uh, which is a, a, an island I've gotten to know really from going there for strandings, which every year we always get uh, reports from there. So uh, what is a marine mammal stranding? Basically, uh, the bottom line is that a marine mammal that is out of habitat and in, is in distress. Uh, and that can be to a, you know, due to a myriad of things, uh, as you can imagine, illness, uh, human impacts like entanglement, uh, getting hit by a boat or a vessel, uh, ballistic trauma, uh, stress due to human harassment. That's actually one of the big uh, issues that we deal with is stress to human harassment. It's well-meaning, but it's often where people want to put, for example, a seal pup back in the water, or uh, they bring it out of the water onto shore. I've had that happen. Uh, they want to pat it. Um, they want to sit next to it and sing songs to it and so on and so forth, but it's very stressful on the animal. Uh, so that is one of the key things that we deal with. Um, of course, then there's also natural injuries that they get, you know, just like, like we get injured, like wild, other wildlife get injured, um, they, they will get natural injuries. Um, and then being lost, um, that sounds sort of funny, but some seemingly get lost and that can be due to natural causes or again from human uh, or anthropogenic causes as well. So out of habitat for cetaceans, and cetaceans is just the, simply the whales, dolphins, and porpoises, uh, collectively known as cetaceans. Uh, out of habitat for them is, that's, it's pretty easy to uh, say whether that animal is stranded because a whale on shore that is alive shouldn't be there. Uh, they can't handle being on a beach. Uh, they are heavy animals. They would crush their internal organs if they're lying there for prolonged periods of time. Uh, so they're just way too heavy. And they're not ambulatory on land. They can't move around readily. Um, the other thing is that they don't have any fur or hair. So they're not protected from the sun. So they can actually get sunburned. So a whale on shore, that is definitely a stranding. That, that's pretty easy. You will get this kind of situation, which looks like, wow, that looks like a killer whale stranding. It's actually a very risky technique that some killer whale populations that are the marine mammal eating types will utilize uh, to sort of rush onto a beach to grab a sea lion in this case. Um, not on our shores, we don't have sea lions here. Um, and so it's a risky uh, uh, predation strategy. And there's the odd time if it's a young animal, perhaps doesn't know how to do it too well, might end up stranding. So that's an example of uh, perhaps a different kind of stranding that uh, it sort of brought it on themselves. So, um, so why do cetaceans strand? Um, uh, it's a really complex answer really, because it's multifaceted. Uh, you have to sort of tease out a couple of things, first of all. Mass strandings versus single strandings. You will get mass strandings of toothed whales, typically. They involve toothed whales or what we call the odontocetes. And toothed whales include all your dolphins, the porpoises, orcas or killer whales, sperm whales, the beaked whales, and so on. And there's a lot of theories abound as to, to why you get these mass strandings, like in the picture below here. Uh, these are pilot whales, and this was in New Zealand in 2017 with over 600 pilot whales stranding in this big crush of whales. Um, we don't know for sure, but really it's a case by case thing. You have to look at what was going on weather wise. Um, it was an animal sick and they all came in. There's even talk about the sonar because they use echolocation, that something threw them off could be due to sound in the ocean of which we have made it incredibly noisy now with all the ship traffic. Um, another theory is unfamiliar bathymetry. For example, Cape Cod, you all familiar with in Massachusetts, it's like a big arm sticking out in the ocean. And Cape Cod, especially around Wellfleet on Cape Cod, is a big hotspot for mass strandings. My colleagues there have every single winter, especially, will get mass strandings of various dolphin species. 
And it's these are offshore species. And we sort of figured that they get into the bay, perhaps they were chasing food in there, maybe it was a storm, something that drew them into the bay and they get into some of these marshy shallows and then the tide goes out and they are left high and dry. Um, so it could be it's an unfamiliar area to them, we don't know. So it sounds like it's a cop out, but it really is sometimes you can have a straightforward answer as to why a particular stranding happened and other times is we really have no idea. So each case really is unique. I mentioned that the mass strandings, and I'll just, sorry, I'll just flip back. Mass strandings are involve adonoceids. It doesn't tend to involve what are called the baleen whales and or mysticetes. And baleen whales do not have teeth in their mouth. They have in place of teeth, they have these baleen plates, hundreds of them that line the upper jaws and create kind of a curtain. And they, the reason why there are at least 14 species that have these baleen plates in lieu of teeth has to do with their feeding ecology or strategy. So they prey on some tiny food, which seems rather odd that the biggest animals in the world feed on some of the smallest, but it's because the smaller food are more highly caloric than fish higher up in what's called the trophic level in the ocean. So these whales, can open up their mouths, taking a load of small fish or krill or whatever they're feeding on, and then close, and of course they're taking in seawater, you can't not take the fish in and not take in seawater, but they can't drink the seawater. But if they close their mouth, they can filter or push that seawater up between those hundreds of plates, very effectively capturing and keeping the fish inside their mouth, and then they swallow it. Now, baleen whales, you tend to get single baleen whales, and it has to do with their social structure. Toothed whales tend to create these tight-knit social groups. Baleen whales don't, don't. it's much more loose-knit groups. Yes, they can come together. I might go out and see 60 humpback whales, which are a kind of baleen whale, but that's not a group that's going to stay together. They'll just as readily split up as come together in a group. So that's important to know. So for a stra single strandings of cetaceans, uh, you can have both the tooth or the baleen whales, but for mass strandings, it's typically the toothed whales. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> However, then you get a, a, a situation like this. This was December of 2016 in Chile on the south, uh, southern area of Chile. And they found all these carcasses of say whales and say whales are a kind of baleen whale. And yet you look at this and you say, well, Rosie, that's a mass stranding. It is a lot of say whales together on shore, but they did not collectively come in together. It looks like they died well offshore and then floated in due to the currents collecting them in a certain area. Uh, the cause we don't know, it could have been, um, some shellfish poisoning or, or not, not shellfish poisoning, but some sort of algal growth in the, in the ocean, we don't know. One thing, it was very hard to get to these carcasses because it was a very remote spot. And even doing one, what's called a necropsy, that's an autopsy on an animal, just to do one necropsy on that very large whale, uh, and say whales are about 50 to 60 feet in length, would be just enormous. So to have 305 carcasses is, I, I can't even imagine that. So, so that's a situation where it looks like a mass stranding of baleen whales, but in effect, it's just where a lot of baleen whales died end up collecting there. So what about pinnipeds? And pinnipeds are your seals. Seals, sea lions, walrus, those are all collectively known as pinnipeds. Now we don't have sea lions in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there you'll find them on the West Coast, but not here. So we deal with what we call the phocid seals collectively. Um, so when you look at these four seals, there's actually two species right here. This little fella on the top uh, left-hand corner, a very plump, uh, healthy looking harbor seal pup. So it might be, oh, a week and a half, maybe two weeks old. It's lying on its side. It looks really good. Um, nice, healthy animal. If we had a call, and we like to get calls about all animals, whether dead or alive, marine mammals, um, we like to know what's around and about, and then we can go and do a health assessment. 
Uh, even photos are important. You can take lots of good photos, respectfully from a distance if you can, uh, so we don't stress the animal out or end up flushing them back in the water. Um, that's incredibly helpful to us because then we know what we're dealing with. And if we see a nice healthy looking animal, we know that's one that we can monitor and keep an eye on. And it might be gone the next day, it might not. We might find that in fact, it was starting to get sick and then goes downhill. And then, then we could collect it. Um, this little fella on the right top corner, uh, that's a newborn. And this is these are not the intestines hanging out, which we often get reported to us. Um, that's its umbilicus. And it looks pink and healthy looking. Um, it's a nice looking little harbor seal pup. It's also a harbor seal pup, but it looks a little different from the one on the left. And the reason why is the one on the right is a premature pup. It's still wearing this white coat that is called a lanugo. It's a birth coat, but harbor seal pups, tend, the mothers are, sorry, the pups will lose that lanugo coat in utero with harbor seals so that they're born with this full term coat, like the one on the left-hand side. So if I saw a photo of this little guy on the right, what would give me pause for concern is that it's a premature pup, even though otherwise it looks um, otherwise in good shape. I would still wanna monitor it and it might be a candidate that I would collect for rehab. The bottom two seals, they're also, um, they're both the same species. And if you saw that harp seal juvenile on Sears Island a few weeks ago, uh, you would know this is a harp seal juvenile, what we call a beater. Uh, we call them beaters because they beat the water um, at sort of an awkward swimming style at that young age, so hence the term. But they're basically 12 to 14 months old at that stage. And they have this sort of coloration. It's sort of randomly placed splotches on, on, a, on the body of the animal. Now, this animal on the lower left is also a harp seal. It's an adult harp. It's got the famous harp on the back, hence its name, that they only get when they're about four years old. So this little fella on the uh, right doesn't have that yet. And it would also get the nice chocolate brown head. Now, the thing with the one in the lower left is that harp seal adult is in the grass. The harp seal is an Arctic seal. We have them up in my home of Canada, but we do get them in the Gulf of Maine, uh, usually in the winter time. This is winter, but it came up and was up in this field. It was a little thin looking by its body condition. It also looked dehydrated and it was an animal that we did collect for rehab. The one on the right, the juvenile, is a nice, plump, alert, responsive harp seal, but it's on a road <laughs> and it shouldn't be on a road. It was actually at the entrance to Acadia National Park at the Scudic entrance that we got a call. And when we came out to it, uh, we could tell because it had, you could see the marks in the, the bit of gravel on the, the road that it had crossed the street, gone down a bike path, crossed back over, and decided it was gonna lie by the side of the road. So all that demanded from us was to then guide it back into the water, which was actually, it's just off out of the photo, but the, the water was about 20 to 30 feet away. So it wasn't far. Uh, the harp seal did not appreciate my student Siobhan and me hurting it to the water, but we had to keep saying it's for your own good. So, Moving along, why do we respond to strandings? What, what, why is this necessary? Well, there's a few things. I guess the impetus for it all uh, really stems from what is called the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. And I just wanna say this was an amazing piece of legislation enacted by Congress back then, because when you think about it, 1972, this was really on the cusp of the environmental movement. Uh, you know, they were still whaling, uh, we didn't, I think, you know, the term climate change wasn't even heard of at that point, uh, at least for the majority of people. So why this was really revolutionary piece of legislation was that it was the first to mandate an ecosystem based approach to marine, ma marine resource management. So it wasn't just, let's say marine mammals, it was the whole marine ecosystem, which really was sort of ahead of its time. The MMPA was enacted due to the public response for the dolphin mortality in the tuna purse uh, same fishery, 
of course, this commercial whaling and also the killing of harp seals for the fur trade. So those were the key things that pushed for uh, the enacting of the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. And it's coming up to its 50th anniversary next year, I just noticed. So what does the MMPA, as we call it, say? In a nutshell, it is illegal in the United States to harass, to pursue, and I always like to add to or annoy, torment, you can't harm, you cannot kill any marine mammal. And it doesn't matter if this is an endangered species or if it is an abundant species. And for the record, all the seal species we find in the Gulf of Maine are, uh, they're not endangered, uh, their uh, populations are abundant. But keep in mind that the gray seal, which if you're familiar with the large gray seal, um, in the, and also with the harbor seal in the early 1900s, there were bounties on them and the gray seal was almost extirpated in the Gulf of Maine. There was hardly any. So when people say, oh, there's all these gray seals now, well, that's how it naturally was back in the early 1900s until we sort of killed them off in this bounty. So as well, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and I, I won't go forever into the MMPA, but it's important to know, uh, and it, it really segues into why we do what we do. Um, there's two kinds of uh, harassment, and this was actually amended in 1994, um, where they divided the harassment to the more serious one of level A harassment, which has the potential to injure or hurt any marine mammal uh, or any marine mammal stock in the wild. And then there's level B harassment, which is the one that we deal with mo more, which is to disturb the marine mammal. So, you know, you might go by in your kayak and end up flushing a bunch of seals off, um, off a rocky ledge into the water. You've actually violated the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, in the level B harassment category. So, and the other term I'll throw in here is one called a take. Um, if I flush a bunch of seals off the rocky ledge, that is termed a take. It comes from whaling, um, back in whaling days, if you kill the whale, that was a take, you've taken it effectively out of the population. But if you wound a whale, that is also a take. So in this sort of uh, context, uh, we use the term take to mean to harass, hunt, capture, kill, or attempt to harass, hunt, capture, or kill any marine mammal. And this is an example of a take. It doesn't look serious, but that is an animal that you should not be swimming with. Um, this is a, a beluga whale that came down here uh, from Canadian waters that hung around uh, more in Southern Maine, although it did come up to Mount Desert Island at one point. Uh, but people were, in, were um, engaging with the animal, um, which is effectively against law by the MMPA. Another stressor that has emerged in the last few years are selfies, um, and to the point where Noah even created a uh, no selfies with seals uh, poster. Um, and while this is not Maine, this is uh, California because we do not have sea lions in the North Atlantic, but I can't believe that people uh, were harassing these, these poor uh, fur seals right here. Um, and I don't know, understand why people are huddle around these two animals uh, to take selfies. It's just beyond me. Uh, so don't do that. So uh, again, all the messaging that came up from NOAA Fisheries that we, we worked, uh, we actually had a messaging workshop. Um, I was gonna say last fall, but we were all in COVID then. It was the uh, fall of 2019. Um, to figure out what some what messaging we really need to uh, bring to the public that perhaps we weren't doing well enough. And I think the bottom line was people need to keep their distance because it really does stress them out when you approach too close. Uh, it could be something uh, as simple as uh, coming up and having them raise their heads. If they raise their head and look at you, you've crossed that kind of invisible threshold. Um, they may turn away, they may go back on the water. Um, all those signs are that you've, you've approached too close. And I mentioned kayaks. Um, 
interestingly, uh, kayaks can really disturb seals. You might think that they don't because they're a quiet um, conveyance, a quiet boat. You know, you come around and go, hey, this is great. I'm going to look at those nice seals. I won't be bothering them. But the thing is, you're too quiet and you take them by surprise and they startle and they they're flushed into the water. And I used to, you know, each summer get uh, calls from angry locals uh, saying that, you know, the kayaks are getting too close to the seal edges and they're seeing all the seals being flushed in the water. Um, and interestingly, uh, lobster boats don't disturb them at all because they're noisy and uh, they hear them coming and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm used to that. So they're kind of habituated to, to hearing um, boats that have engines as opposed to, to kayaks. So, I mean, it's, it's fine to be in a kayak. I love kayaking, uh, but just take a wide berth around any uh, seal colonies. You don't want to flush them in the water. They have hauled out for a reason. And just some more messaging, uh, just to really ram this home with everybody, is to give them their space and let them be. And that's not to say don't observe seals, because they're such fun to watch. I get that. Uh, but if you have binoculars, uh, you can watch them from a distance. Um, and I know they did that on Sears Island with the harp seal, and that was great. And, and then it went into the ocean on its own. So that was good to know. It wasn't pressured because then I worry if, if the animal was pressured into the water, where's it going to come out? And then it's going to be a different area. So um, it's important to give them their space. Coming from the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, something else happened in, in the 1992 amendments. Uh, they formalized the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program. Um, and it has various components to it, as you can see here. And one of them are the stranding networks uh, of which uh, were throughout the entire United States and, and islands. And, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And the uh, Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program itself turns 30 in 2022 as well. And uh, we have uh, some top-notch people heading that program. Uh, including several veterinarians. And they're, they're just so, I just want to say they're so hardworking. I'm just so impressed by them. So um, kudos to them. Now, the thing with marine mammals and why it's important to deal with strandings, um, you've got to remember that, that they're kind of like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, they can be an indicator of ocean health. Remember, that's their habitat. They're top level predators. And they eat a lot of the various kinds of fish that we like to eat as well. And, and some of, of those species uh, of seal, like the harbors, live in coastal areas that are utilized by all of us. Uh, so when marine mammals show, show signs of illness or distress, uh, that might be an indicator that there's something not very good in their marine environment, in their home. So they may be signaling changes in the marine environment that, of course, could have some significant implications for the health of our uh, ocean ecosystem. And one thing that we're sort of on guard for and trained to do is uh, to recognize uh, what's called an unusual mortality event. With COVID-19, you should all be familiar with this concept of, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, for us, it's animals getting sick and we get a, a die off or a lot of animals, they're either sick or dying. Um, and we've had unusual mortality events on harbor seals. We just had that UME end just a year or so ago. Uh, we had a major die off of harbor seals in uh, August, September of 2018. And I remember because I left to go to Scotland to go to grad school. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of my colleagues was taking over for me. And I felt so badly for about five minutes uh, that she had to deal with this uh, UME and she got the brunt of it. And, but she did a stellar job. So um, it's important to recognize, and as I say, we, we're, we work hard to sort of recognize when we have such an event going on. So monitoring and studying marine mammal health it is important uh, for their conservation, for maintaining healthy oceans. And I look at it from an individual level because I like to think of it as like this little guy here, this little harbor seal pup who's very cute and came right up to my cell phone for a picture. Um, you want to do the humane thing for the animal, first of all. 
But then in the wider population level, you want to be able to identify if there's something that's affecting the population of seals or whatever species of marine mammal. And then from that, the ocean itself. So stranding network is, uh, you know, we're really on the front lines to recognize those red flags. So I mentioned the stranding network. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and I'll show you a map in a little, uh, in a sec uh, of the different regions, uh, but each member or agency within the network um, holds what's called a stranding agreement. Because I said marine mammals, they're federally protected. Marine Mammal Protection Act, you're not allowed to touch them or do anything with them. So what am I doing touching them and doing things with them like me here with these seals? Um, it's because we hold a letter of uh, authorization from the federal government, from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, it used to be called a letter of agreement, an LOA. Now, then they changed it to stranding agreement or an SA. And uh, so we're mandated by NOAA to handle all live and dead marine mammals. Now, each agency is a little different. Um, you might have um, one agency that only does rehab, but they don't do response. Uh, for us, we only do response. We don't have a rehab facility. Uh, we have to send any animals that need to go to rehab to either southern Maine or out of state to Massachusetts. Minimally, we are required by NOAA Fisheries to collect what's called level A data. And level A data is, uh, you know, the date, the location, the species of animal, the age class. Was it dead? Was it alive? Uh, if it was alive, was it sick, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a lot of basic data. And then we input that into the National Stranding Database, which is really amazing and comprehensive and goes back years. Um, we also do necropsies. That is an autopsy on an animal. We collect samples. We get send them out for analysis, which may help answer questions about what happened to the animal contributes to the whole case on that particular animal. We also do outreach. We do training workshops. In fact, we have our spring uh, training workshop coming up in a few weeks, which I have yet to <laughs> uh, hone down the date or, or figure out the date for. Um, and, uh, and I say it's training volunteers, but I always like anybody to come to our workshops just to get information about marine mammals. That's fine. You don't have to be a volunteer if you don't want to. Um, lectures, of course, like tonight we're doing, uh, we like to hold workshops and we often go to conferences as well. So all part of our training. So here's a map showing the uh, United States and also Canada, Mexico, uh, but you can see that uh, we're part of what's called the greater Atlantic region from Virginia up to Maine. So we're the most northerly end of our stranding response region. There's also the Southeast region. You also have Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And then on the West Coast, you have Southwest and Northwest, Hawaii, uh, sorry, Hawaii. <laughs> I do know geography. And uh, up here and up in Alaska as well. So our region is Rockland. Uh, there we are, a Rockland up to Calais, uh, or the Canadian, up to the Canadian border and all the islands in between, which if you could stretch out all those peninsulas and islands would be roughly 2,600 miles of coastline. So that's uh, quite a bit to deal with. And as I mentioned, this we're talking about Northern Maine and our region, which begged the question, well, who looks after Southern Maine? And that would be uh, the marine mammals of Maine uh, who started up back in 2014 to 2015 when uh, the University of New England, which had a rehab facility, they decided to close that and we were left bereft in southern Maine or anywhere in Maine for a rehab facility. So Marine Mammals of Maine started up and they have a rehab facility and they do response as well and they're based now in Brunswick. Looking at some of the species, again, um, I could talk forever. They'd be lectures unto themselves, but uh, just to give you some of the players that you might see here, <clears throat> keeping in mind that you can get species that come down and make rare visits. So that does happen for sure. Among the pinnipeds are seals, uh, the harbor seals, of course, that we've already talked about a little bit. 
Uh, this nice pair of harbor seal pups, this was on Mount Desert Island a few years ago. Um, these are two little fellas that decided they were gonna hang out together waiting for their respective moms. Uh, these are not twins. Um, and then down here uh, in the lower left-hand corner, we have the gray seal. Gray seals tend to be a little bit more offshore. They're a much bigger seal and they actually give birth to their young in winter. And uh, this animal right here, that it looks quite big, but that is a gray seal pup. And they are born with a lanugo coat that is natural for them. And that makes sense. They're born with that extra fur coat because they're born in winter. So that, that's helpful. Harbor seals really being born in spring don't need an extra fur coat on. So the gray seals, uh, you'll see right there, as I said, they're much, much bigger, uh, often called the horsehead seal because of the shape of their head. Uh, they look quite different from the little harbor seals. On the right side are some of the Arctic species that we see. At the top is the hooded seal. And hooded seals are interesting. They're quite a wandering species. They are an ice loving seal found really in the north. We will get uh, hooded seals coming to the Gulf of Maine. But it's funny looking over the data, we haven't had one in a few years actually. Um, and I also find with hooded seals, you can get them even in summer sometimes, you'll get a pulse of several hooded seals coming down for a visit. Um, so it, it is an animal that we can sometimes get here. The Arctic seal coming from Canada is the harp seal that I've already mentioned. Um, you know, we had the one at um, Sears Island just a few weeks ago. Uh, again, you recognize this photo. There's a nice, healthy looking harp seal juvenile. And here's the harp seal adult. And this is a better picture showing that nice, looks like a lyre harp on the back. And, and that's how they get their name. Uh, quickly, the cetaceans or whales, the large whales that we have include the humpback whale, uh, which you can see off here uh, when you go out in a whale watch. Other players include the minke whale. And the minke whale is the smallest of the baleen whales that we get here, which by the way, these are all baleen whales in, in this collage here. Um, the minke is uh, about 25 foot animal and we will sometimes get them coming right into the bay. So that's not totally unusual to find. Um, humpbacks and fin whales. Um, fin whale is the second largest animal on earth. Uh, they're around 60 to 70 feet, beautiful streamlined animal. Humpbacks a little smaller at 45 feet. They're kind of the show off of the ocean, uh, breaching and so on. In the corner down here, the lower right is the northern right whale, which is um, the most endangered of the great whales. And uh, uh, we do get them in our waters in the Gulf of Maine, and then they head up into Canadian waters. Uh, and I heard a report that up in the Bay of, uh, sorry, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they um, saw their first right whale up there for the season. And just to put in a plug there, uh, this is a humpback tail. The tail are known as the flukes. And for humpback whales, the underside, this is called the ventral side, have these unique black and white markings. And they can range from an all black underside of the tail to all white and every gradation of black and white in between. So this is what we would probably call a type two tail, which is mainly white with some black in the core. So we are able to identify individual humpback whales uh, from their tail patterns. And at Allied Whale, we hold what's called the North Atlantic Humpback Whale Catalog, which I used to curate years ago before becoming the stranding coordinator. And it used to have like three or 4,000 individuals. Now it has over 10,000 humpback whales in that catalog. And I'm just mentioning that because when we do get a dead humpback whale, if the pigmentation or the black and white markings are on the tail, then I hopefully can identify who that is. And that can give a lot of information and add um, to the story for that animal. Among the small cetaceans are smaller whales that we get. Um, and these are all toothed whales, by the way, um, include the lovely little harbor porpoise. And I apologize that they're all dead, but there you go. Um, a harbor porpoise, are, really one of my favorite little cetaceans, a uh, beautiful little animal. We get them quite a bit here. So not unusual to see them coming right into the bays close up. Uh, they can do that, hence their name, Harbor Porpoise. 
Um, other species include the common dolphin down here, the lower uh, left and the top uh, right, the Atlantic white-sided dolphin. Um, these two are oceanic dolphins. They're offshore animals. When I, and they're, they would be found in tight-knit social groups. So if I found one by itself alive in a bay or up a river, well, it shouldn't be up a river, um, then that would be pause for concern. To me, that would be an animal that's not doing well, that it's come inshore like that. And just a bit more on small cetaceans, uh, the pilot whale. Uh, we get these uh, more, I think the sightings are more in the fall for pilot whales. Uh, and actually, I had just recently up in, in the town of Penobscot, up the Bagadoosh River, across from Castine, um, I had a report of a dead pilot whale uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, it looked, well, it had been dead for months, and it was a calf. It was only seven feet. These guys get up to about 15 feet. Um, so it probably died last summer or fall, and currents and so on, just and tidal currents brought it right up the river. Um, we also get what's called Risso's dolphins, or another name for them is the gray grampus. It's another offshore dolphin species. And in fact, we had one back, I think it was 2003 or four, uh, there was one seen swimming off Sears Island. Um, and I remember watching it, and then even the police department came to keep an eye on it as well. And I saw it go on a dive, this is a live one, and it went on a dive and I never saw it again. And then several months later, we got a call about a dead, uh, dead whale on shore and we identified it as being a rissa. So highly likely it was the same animal. Cases. Um, so I'll go over a few of the cases because cases are fun. Um, and I say working out the logistics. I mean, that's what I do. It sounds funny. I always say I'm a marine mammal coordinator. It's like I coordinate where they're going to come and strand. Well, it's really just working out the logistics of what we're going to do with a particular animal. Can we get it to rehab? If not, can we overnight it uh, and then get it to rehab? So it's sort of working out all the um, working out all the logistics. So here we go. Uh, up in Lubeck, uh, this was back. Uh, a year or two ago. I can't see the top of my screen now. So, whoops, there we go. Um, this was a young humpback whale, a female that came in, uh, reported to us in Boot Cove. Um, of course, those wonderful cobbly beaches that we get to work on, um, you have to be so careful on. The other thing we had to deal with was we were trying to bring in this humpback whale to do an exam on it and to get some samples and so on. But we couldn't bring it up any closer because the bathymetry is such that it just the the shoreline just dropped off. And uh, as well, uh, the tidal currents, you have that Bay of Fundy tides. And at one point when I was in the water, we're wearing waders, but I got swept right off my feet into the brink. And thankfully, uh, none of our students <laughs> filmed that happening. So all was good. But uh, yeah, we managed to get uh some measurements on the animal and some samples but it it was interesting working environment for sure this was last august um boy what a hot day that was um this was and i'm sorry for the really really dead whales um but this is this is my world uh and it's it's an important one despite what they look like going to all these animals because I mean I know what they look like sort of in real life if you will and they're magnificent animals and even a dead one in this condition can offer a lot and it's important to document uh, so I was getting measurements I was getting samples plus I was looking for any outward signs of human interaction whether that be entanglement or propeller injuries or anything like that it's all part of the investigation working around this whale was most interesting um, because those uneven rocks covered with the slippery rockweed was interesting. You can see I've got a boat uh, hook right there, which helped me get around. Um, the other thing was that the whale was pooling whale grease. Remember they have blubber, so it's greasy. So a lot of the rocks got all sort of greased up and I had to uh, alert my, uh, my Kate Patty, who she and her husband kindly took me in their boat to this remote spot. And uh, 
I had to warn her about some of the rocks that were slippery with whale grease. Um, but, you know, we managed and uh, got the information I needed, but I was really getting tired of <laughs> all these uneven rocks and rock weed. I was so wishing we had long, long stretches of sandy beaches like Southern Maine, but there you go. The other thing, uh, sometimes we have to work uh, out of boats. Uh, this was a right whale calf, uh, which was immensely important to get information. Uh, why am I cutting into it? It's because I'm getting a sample from lacerations. This animal died due to uh, propeller strike. There was a series of lacerations down its, uh, what's called the caudal peduncular tailstock. And I'm getting, um, samples, cross-cut samples, and that goes to histology while they look at the cells um, to determine and confirm um, that it was uh, pre or post-mortem. Um, so, uh, so sometimes you, you, you have to work in such conditions. And back to the, the rocks and rockweed, uh, this was a, a humpback on uh, Great Spruce Island, north, well in down East Maine. Um, it was interesting trying to get a straight length, which is what I'm trying to do here, uh, but I couldn't even get up right to the head of the animal because all this sort of brown, this is all whale grease against this uh, sort of cliff right here. So we had to sort of uh, pass the uh, measuring tape to, you can't see them, but the top of the cliff, there's a whole marine mammals uh, class from College of the Atlantic with their professor. And we had to hand the, um, the uh, measuring tape up to them, we, we sort of had to work out a straight length that way. Uh, but this was an animal that uh, even though we could not match it from its tail pattern, this is tail, and normally this would have the nice black and white pattern, but it's so decomposed, it was long gone. However, by taking a skin sample, uh, we, uh, do, to my colleagues, they were able to identify it to a known Gulf of Maine individual humpback that was named Kilter. And that's kind of sad when you do identify uh, ones that you know. And this was a minke whale we had on Sand Beach in Acadia National Park. And finally, I get to work on a nice sandy beach. Um, I want to say kudos to the rangers at Acadia National Park and all the staff who've always been just absolutely stellar in working with us and we with them. Um, this minke whale, we uh, guided off the beach. In fact, we got a lot of beachgoers to help us tow it um, into beyond some rocks. Um, they were quite intrigued, as you can see, all these people around it. Um, so we do a lot of outreach uh, instead of just pushing people away. It's, we have to have caution tapes, certainly, but um, we want to keep people safe but we also like to impart as much as we can about the animal and about conservation as well. And in fact, when we got it off the beach, we took it to the next cove over that's known as Otter Cove and we did the necropsy there and we created a whole outreach area as well so that people could see what we're doing and all about the animal and so on. A few of the seals and then I'll get to some of the uh, Sears Island ones. Um, this is hands down my favorite little harbor seal pup. Um, it was from South Blue Hill back in 2005. And it was a little premature pup. You can see it's wearing that white Lanugo coat. And the people there named him Rufus. And Rufus has always been my favorite. Uh, we did collect him and this is him. Uh, we, we're authorized to hold uh, animals overnight and uh, we, we give nourishment. So uh, we tube feed and that's a whole other lecture. But so we can give fluids and so on um, and do a blood draw, whatever else we need to do. And so it's just resting. As you can see, it's Lanugo coat has dried out. You got that nice fluffy coat, which doesn't last long. It then starts to fly off because they shed it. Um, not good if you have allergies, which thankfully I don't, but um, my friend who was one of our vets at the time did have, have allergies, so it kind of got to her. Uh, but you can see this pup is resting. They sometimes like little stuffed animals and, and so on. So uh, Rufus went to rehab and did very well, and then he was released. And I will point out why they wear the little tags on the head. Uh, they have a number. And that's so that the those who are working with them in rehab know who's who. And if there's any meds that a certain animal needs, then they can make sure that they get to the correct animal. Otherwise, they all look the same. 
So again, working in our nice rocky environment, um, I'm not sure if you notice the pop right there, but um, the seal pops or all the seals really blend in so well in our very um, rocky environment in Down East Maine. Um, I, I, I can't count how many calls I've had that preface their call with, I would have never found the seal except my dog found it, or I nearly stepped on the seal, I, ne I feel so badly. So they're very cryptic. Um, I guess that's a good thing in some ways, but then not if you end up having a dog run out to the seal um, and ends up being harassed or even bitten. Um, but that, that's how it goes. And, and we find that um, our colleagues in Southern Maine get triple the volume of calls than, than we do up here. Uh, big part of that is that they have a bigger population in Southern Maine than we do up here. But the other thing is that they have longer stretches of sandy beaches. Uh, we have preponderance of these rocky beaches where um, seals just blend in. So there, there definitely is a reporting factor there. Oh, um, there is a story to this little guy. Uh, this uh, little female seal pup, full-term pup, she was on the Bar to Bar Island. If you're familiar with Bar Harbor, its name comes from that bar at low tide to the island. And it was sighted there. So I'm doing a health assessment with it. And the next day we get a call saying there's a seal pup up um, off West Street. So it had just moved a few hundred yards around the corner um, up the road. Uh, to where the Seacoast Mission is, and it was at this little inlet. And so we, we had a look at it and think, okay, we've got to keep an eye on you. Uh, but so far it's active, it's swimming and so on. And, and you don't, there's a real fine balancing act that we go through with when should this guy go to rehab or should it go to rehab? Because you have to remember that bringing a seal to rehab is incredibly stressful. Uh, me picking it up, it, it doesn't know me, I'm just an alien being. So it's really stressful on these animals. So I have to weigh that and you know, it might be doing just fine. So it, it, it's tough sometimes. So we have this little guy, um, I'll go back here, uh, at this inlet off West Street. And then the two days later, uh, May 26, which is my birthday, by the way, Five in the morning, I was already up because I had two seal pups that were at a student's house in town. There's a, a gaggle of, of our students that were holding two seals overnight because they were tube feeding them all through the night. They were giving them all their feedings, which is really terrific. Um, so they already had two. I was up early because we had to tube feed the two of them and I was gonna take them down to rehab. But I get a call from the police department saying there's a seal in the road and you can see this little guy right here this little girl it's the same one um and so i <laughs> i had to do some quick thinking and i called the rehab facility and said can you take a third and they were great they got right back to me honestly i thought do these people even sleep um they got back to me and said yes we can take a third pop i then contacted our student Siobhan, who, by the way, is at vet school and is going to be an amazing vet. Um, I said, Siobhan, can you pick up the seal? It's in the road. And she says, I'm on it. And she zipped down the road, got this seal pup, and uh, we got it to the college. So now we had three seals to tube feed and get ready for uh, transport. And they all went uh, to the facility at the National Marine Life Center. It's in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. If you're ever down there, go see them. They're just amazing, uh, wonderful, work hard. Um, can't say enough great things about them. They had, these are all our four pups. And uh, that's um, the little pup that was in the road. They named her uh, Rosalind Franklin. Um, sounds like a funny name. It's based on Rosalind Franklin, who uh, of course famous for helping identify the DNA molecule structure back in the day. Um, National Marine Life Center decided they're gonna do these celebrity, celebrity names, which made for some real tongue twisters. But anyway, that's what they called her. And she did very well. And then she was finally released. So hopefully she's still doing well out there. So to a few Sears Island cases, every year, as I said, I always get one to two calls and I've already got the first one for the year from a few weeks ago. 
Um, this goes back to 2006, uh, out on Sears Island, it was on the causeway or next to the causeway. And this is a premature pup. You, you're all trained now, so you can see it's it's wearing this lanugo coat, the fur coat that it shouldn't have. So that's a preemie. And we collected it and we took it down to uh, the, den, the then existing facility called Marine Animal Lifeline, which was in Westbrook, Maine. Um, and we took it there to rehab. And a week later, didn't we go get another call about a seal pup also on the causeway? Uh, and as you can see, we had one of Sears Port's finest uh, on the beach and the seal pup clearly thought, I'm doing well, I'll just uh, get in the shade uh, of uh, the, uh, <laughs> the police officer's boot. Uh, so there he was and we collected him. I brought him down Marine Animal Lifeline and uh, as my colleague Ashley, uh, checking lungs and heart uh, of this animal, um, they have quite a protocol for the admit and then they go into a cage, which is just a quarantine. That's not where they stay, but initially they do for the first 24 hours or so. And then they're put into a pool and then, then they graduate to the larger pool over time. So it's quite a process and I will add, it is lengthy process uh, for them to go into rehab. They're gonna be there for at least three or four months easily because they have to learn everything uh, that mom would have taught them. Because remember, these guys are coming in as dependent pups. By the end of June, we're, we're safely into, or about to be safely into what we call independent pup time. So if you call me about a pup in August and say it's missing its mother, it's not, it's, it's long weaned at that point. Uh, this uh, pup uh, was on the causeway to Sears Island, and uh, my colleague and our veterinarian, Dr. Balamowitz, um, she kindly said she would come up and have a look. And, and at the time, I used to always feel guilty asking Carissa to uh, look at an animal, uh, but she said this is her love, working with marine mammals, so she never minded, even coming from work. Uh, so uh, Dr. Blamowitz or Carissa came um, and what we did, because remember, these are at this point we're, we're well, we're July now. So we're probably safely into dependent pup time, independent pup time. Sorry. Uh, but what she did was she did what we call a mini relocation. So she took it from this area here where it was. She took it over to that headland in case it still was with mom, although by July it should be weaned. But just in case, she didn't want to take it too far. So she took it to that headland. But what did that pup do? It came right back to where all the people were on the beach. You don't see that in this uh, photo. But there were all these people around that pup at the time. So uh, we ended up collecting it. And it went to the University of New England um, in southern Maine and Biddeford. At the time, they had a rehab facility, uh, which has since closed. And I think this might be the final one. Uh, this Harbor Seal pup was from 2017. Um, it was on the west side of um, Sears Island. And we had to walk all the way down the road because we didn't know about friends of Sears Island. We walked all the way down the road, found our way to the shore, and then we hiked all the way down. So it took us probably a good hour to get there. And then we had to find the seal, which being so cryptic, of course, they blend in. Uh, but then we found it right here and it had an injury uh, on its side. And also you can't see in the photo, but on the other side of its neck. So we had to collect this pup, but it's, uh, we thought well, at the time we had brought the carrier down. So Evan, who's in the picture up here, heading out of um, down the beach, he walked all the way back and had the foresight to read the sign and see that there's these friends of Sears Island. And he, uh, he gave them a call and said, hey, could you open up the gate? You know, we're, we have a seal we're trying to rescue. So uh, that worked really well. They came and opened up the gate. At least Evan was able to drive all the way down to the shore. Um, although we did have that long walk, as you probably all familiar with this beach, uh, it's not easy walking. Um, and then when you've got a carrier with a seal in it. Um, so we got the seal to rehab. It went to uh, the Marine Mammals of Maine, the newer uh, rehab facility in Southern Maine. Um, regretfully, it didn't, uh, they 
tried to bring it back from the brink. It lasted a few days, but it kept crashing. Um, blue, glucose levels just kept crashing um, and it died. So that was kind of sad. It always, it's tough sometimes working with these guys and especially when you've put so much um, into them, you kind of bond with them. And, and this guy was uh, a little trooper as you can <laughs> see in the carrier. So just a little bit about uh, normal seal behavior. Um, this is something that people, uh, we ask people what the seal is doing and so on. And people also give their concerns. Um, we often get people saying, I, I think it's hurt its flipper, its side flipper. And we're, we're looking at or trying to discern what the reason why you would think it's injured. And they'll say, well, it's lying on its side. Um, just so you know, lying on the side or what we call the banana pose, uh, which this harp seal that you're familiar with has that nice sort of banana pose look to it. Um, it's kind of, I always called it the happy pose. It's a comfortable pose that they adopt, helps to thermoregulate. Um, believe it or not, they can get warm, especially if they're well fed. They have a nice blubber layer to them. And even this harp seal is probably finding it really warm on, even on that snow, because remember they're an Arctic species and they're well insulated. Um, so lying on the side is, is usually a nice sign. What I wouldn't wanna see is, I mean, they will lie on their belly sometimes, but if they're flat out, head down, not responsive, I mean, you don't need to be a marine mammologist to realize there's something amiss there. Um, so we, we wanna see sort of alert, responsive, as opposed to this is not responsive, but it's also a sleeping seal pup. So, I mean, that's okay. Uh, vocalizing, you will get vocalizing, especially from the pups, uh, the harbor seal pups. And I'm going to play a couple of videos in a sec, uh, which you'll hear the very plaintive hooting call of the harbor seal, uh, which interestingly, that's how the mom knows its own pup is its uh, vocalization. Um, it's sort of like knowing your own child's um, voice. So the other thing that we get, people say, that seal is really awkward. It looks in distress because it's awkward on land. Um, or its hind flippers must be paralyzed. It's dragging them. And so we, we just need to explain that these are not sea lions, which have a totally different uh, anatomy and, and have hind flippers that splay out and they can move really well on land. But seals do not. Um, they only use those front flippers um, sorry they use the hind flippers when swimming but they don't use them on land they will use the front flippers and they can also when they're older undulate the body to kind of shimmy along but those front flippers really help propel themselves another thing that you'll see on the pops anyway uh, is nursing um, they'll often nurse uh, they'll nurse on anything uh, they'll nurse on themselves, they often nurse, uh, they'll kind of curl around and try and nurse on a hind flipper. Uh, they'll nurse on a rock. I've had them nurse on the carrier. Uh, they'll nurse on your shoe if you let them. Um, and the other thing that people say is that, oh, there's white foam coming out of its mouth. And that's just an artifact of, of nursing on itself. They kind of create a lot of uh, foam from um, uh, the action of nursing itself. I hope that's clear. <laughs> um, so back to these four seals that I had at the beginning, um, perhaps you can see now why a seal like this, that looks great, but why this seal while near water looks pretty great lying on its side, but it's wearing that Lanugo coat and that gives me pause for concern. And then you've got that harp seals I mentioned up on the grass, not looking great, really a bit thin. You see a little concavity in the neck here and the hind quarters. Um, as I said, we did collect that animal. And then this harp seal that, while nice, plump, alert, and responsive, it was by the side of the road. So that was one we had to move. And just to finish up, uh, I mentioned having uh, two little videos, because who doesn't love videos of seal pups? And you'll hear the vocalization. You'll also see the pup using those front flippers, but not the hind flippers. Yeah. 
And that was a seal we did collect and bring to rehab. And finally, th this fella, beautiful, nice, plump harbor seal pop uh, reported by uh, a lobster woman uh, in Tremont on Mount Desert Island. She said, hey, I think it looks great. I said, good, good to know. And she sent this photo. Um, and I thought, well, that'd be fun to go have a look, just look see, because it's not far for me to go. So I went down and uh, I couldn't find it offhand and then noticed I probably heard more than anything, this little fell in the water. So that just shows you um, the pups swimming. Uh, and just know that harbor seals, when they're born, they can swim pretty much from the get-go, unlike some other seal species. Remember, they're not born with a lanugo coat or shouldn't be. Um, so they can and will forage with their moms. Um, but they are babies and they can't uh, they don't have the dive times uh, or the length of dive or the depths that they can go to compare to as an adult. That's something that they build up to, obviously, as they get older. So you'll see this little guy hobnobbing uh, at the surface, and it looks like he's chasing his flippers at one point. And uh, also, you'll hear him uh, make some calls. And just so you see where he is, he's not far from shore. I just pan around, you'll see um, the lobster pound and the lobster traps. So he had been, he or she had been hauled out on shore there and then just went for a swim. And then we heard that the seal was gone later, which is what I suppose was gonna happen. So, so just to see a harbor seal pup waiting for mom. And that's it. Thanks for listening and sticking around and uh, happy to take any questions if you have any. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Rosemary. That was really great. Um, this is Brenda <laughs> from the library. Um, so we have a couple questions and I'll read them to you. Um, Linda asked if on a beach walk and if someone's on a beach walk and they spot a stranded marine mammal, is there a, a an agency and number that they should call? right on the slide oh it depends okay. where you are uh if you are rockland or north to canada uh to Calais, uh that would be us and if not uh you would phone uh the marine mammals of maine uh if it's anywhere south of rockland to new hampshire and in fact you can go online either to NOAA fisheries and the uh, stranding section and it has a list of all the agencies and their contact, um, depending where you are. So yeah. you might be from Maine, but maybe you're down in North Carolina and you find a sea turtle, because we do uh, work with sea turtles as well, by the way, um, or you find uh, you know, a seal or a dolphin and you're like, well, I don't know who to phone down here. 
Uh, if you go online, uh, NOAA Fisheries would have the list of all the agencies. Um, I'm just providing the numbers uh, for you right here if you're in our area of Maine. Um, Rosemary, I did notice that on a couple of your slides, the um, local police were called. So that's also an option because yeah. they have your numbers, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, uh, it was the Bar Harbor Police Department that phoned us about the seal on the road. Um, I also had a seal on the road just a few months ago in February. It was a gray seal pup uh, up in Lubeck. Uh, was, uh, these people have a long driveway. They were coming back like nine at night. And uh, uh, here was this seal. And uh, they, phoned, they phoned the state police and they phoned me. So um, yeah. the police is always a good option. And yeah. they'll, they'll guide you to the correct agency. Right. For sure. Um, Okay, so Silas asks, um, do tracking devices ever fall off in the wild? Uh, depends on the tracking device. I know there's many different kinds. And I know when I was at Scotland at grad school, I did a whole course in what's called biologging and all the various kinds of tags because they pioneered a lot of them, uh, whether for a lot for, for whales and dolphins, but also seals as well. Um, the, it, you mentioned, Silas, you mentioned the tag, like the little tag, uh, I'll start with that one, the tag on the seal's head, those little uh, tiny cone or, or round tags, those will come off in the molt, the next molt. Uh, remember that they molt every year, uh, and that's just where new fur pushes out the old. So if they have a tag on their head, it will fall off. Um, same with uh, satellite tags. There are satellite tags that you can put on seals to get a sense of how they do after rehab, or maybe you want to see where um, their use of habitat or whatever your question is. And you can you use epoxy glue and you put this tag on the seal's head, which doesn't detract from it's living its life appropriately. And those tags fall off um, again because of the molt after a few months. Um, so those tags do come off. There are other kinds of tags, like there's the, what we call the cattle tags, and they're put on their hind flippers. So any, any seal that's been in rehab gets an official tag, and it goes in like you get your ears pierced, it's the same thing. It goes between uh, the webbing between the, um, in the hind flipper, and that's a tag that it will stay on, but some of those do come off as well, but they have more longevity. However, you don't get a lot of return or bang for your buck on those. It's only about 10% of those tags that get re-reported uh, back to you. So I hope, and, and I know on whales, there's various tags that they use as well. So it depends on what you're trying to learn from that animal, uh, whether it's a research project, whether it's just uh, seeing what happens after rehab, but there's many different kinds of tags and many different kinds of attachments. And yes, some do to do fall off. In fact, for some, you do want them to fall off. All right, thank you. Um, let's see the next question. Carolyn asks, what would be a reason why a seal pup is not with its mother until it is weaned? Well, it, it needs to be with its mother part of that time or else it's going to die. Uh, I mean, they can be without nourishment for a few days. Well, not even that. They can, the weight can really drop off dramatically if mom is not back to feed them. That's why we like to wait, you know, 24, 48 hours. It can give you a glimpse into what is happening. Um, so it might be, and, and that's the key thing that we look at is if I have a nice, plump, healthy looking pup and someone says to me, but the pup's been here for three days now and they send me a picture and it's a nice, big, healthy, plump looking pup. And I said, well, that seal is being fed. Um, they might say, yeah, but I haven't seen the mother. And I always say, you're not going to see the mother. You rarely see the mother. If the mother knows you're around, they ain't coming. So that's another reason why it's really important, especially with those dependent pups that are still nursing to keep your distance from them. Um, but yeah, uh, a pup can't go the, the four weeks without nourishment from mom, it, it will die. So I don't know if that answers your question or if I understood it correctly. No, I think it does. Um, Nancy asks, will you please mention where the, up, where the upcoming training will be and when? 
Um, unfortunately, we can't do it in person. It's got to be virtual again, uh, which works for some people, perhaps not for others. We always had such fun doing it in person. Uh, but we had a very successful first virtual winter workshop. Um, you can email me. Uh, the email is there on the slide, r-s-e-t-o-n at coa.edu. Um, and I can um, just say you're interested in your spring workshop. Again, the spring workshop or any of our workshops are for anybody just remotely interested in marine mammals because we want to get people educated about marine mammals in the marine environment. And, you know, you might say, well, I don't have time to volunteer. Not that it would demand a lot of time. You have to understand that um, you can go months without a report and then be flooded with all these harbor seal pups, which is going to happen soon. Um, so it's not like, uh, you know, you're going to be doing stuff every single day. Um, you might for a few days, but it, it's not ongoing. Um, so yeah, just email me, happy to um, send you um, the registration link to Zoom once we do it. We, we're not doing webinars uh, because that's a whole other thing on Zoom. Uh, we don't have a license for that, um, but it, it works um, in training. Uh, so we'll do that again. So please, if you're interested, just All right, thank you. Um, well, that was the last question. Lots of people really enjoyed the program. This was great. Thank you so much. I'm just not reading a few of them. Love the pictures. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, Rosemary. Yeah, you're that, more than welcome. That was really great. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> and as I said, the program will be uploaded to the library's YouTube page soon. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rosemary. That was that was excellent. Really appreciate you being here with us tonight. No, oh, it's my pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Good night.